Hello, beautiful people, and welcome! Hi! To Ask the Jeff Yai Edition! We've got the new patch right around the corner with Kirara's release, where she is going to be on the Yoimiya and uh, Yai banner. So, as usual, I'm gonna be doing an Ask the Jeff on those characters. I'm still not entirely decided whether or not I'll do one on Yoimiya, because so little has changed in terms of Yoimiya's teams and Yoimiya's options that I just don't really know if I have anything new to say. Uh, that being said, a lot of the recent units being release have been Dendro, and so a decent amount has changed in terms of Yai's options. I wouldn't say that a lot has changed in terms of her power, but she's definitely gained a lot of options, so we're gonna get right into that. First things first, what's her overall place in the meta? Pool value, especially compared to the other 3.75 stars, and how much has changed with her since update 3.2, if at all. Let's start by the with the last question, how much has changed since 3.2? The main thing that has changed since 3.2, right, if, if you look at the units that have been released, we've got Yao Yao, we've got Baiju, we've got I'll hide them. I'd say that those are the three main units that are relevant to Yai. So basically, Yao Yao's release, and now more recently Baiju's release, have given her some more defensive options in the Quicken teams that don't force you to sacrifice using Fischl or uh, a good animal unit in order to get your defensive utility, which has been quite nice. Whereas Alhaitham's release has, I guess, kind of given her a slightly better option when it comes to being used as a quote-unquote support character, uh, in the sense that in, in Quicken teams, like in general, you usually kind of just want to focus on getting Fischl to do as much damage as possible to basically cover for your single target and then maybe have an animal unit to do uh, a bunch of swirls to cover for your aoe and generally the best way to go about that is just get a second electro unit and have that unit be on field yai is pretty good at that and she goes pretty well with a bunch of the dendro options that need to be swapped into more often to do their job but that still don't want to spend a lot of time on field, like uh, Technarik, for example. A Hytham's release kind of created, I guess, potential niche for her, where it's basically when you want to have an Electro unit on your team that can deal some damage, but you can't actually trigger Fischl's Ascension 4. So if we go, if we take a look at Fischl's kit real quick. If your current active character triggers an Electro-related elemental reaction when Oz is on the field, the opponent shall be stricken, blah, blah, blah. Deals damage when you trigger Electro-related uh, elemental reactions with your on-field character. Now here's the thing, Quicken is an Electro-related elemental reaction, it's Electro plus Dendro, but Spread is not, because Spread is Dendro plus Quicken. It's kind of like the, the second step of an Electro-related elemental reaction, but it doesn't involve Electro itself, and as such, they don't consider it an Electro-related re elemental reaction. So, what that means is if you apply a, a bunch of Dendro, you kind of just don't get those Ascension, uh, Ascension 4 procs. This, like, lightning that you see at, at, the, at the top, right, this, like, thing that's falling down on him, that's Fischl's animation. If there's no Electro on the enemy, when you trigger Spread, that animation doesn't happen. It can't happen because you're not triggering an Electro reaction. The thing about this is that specific attack has no ICD. So it can trigger an, an Elemental reaction every time it happens. And so, well, the more often it happens, the more damage it deals, and it actually does a very big amount of damage. But when you're playing a team with Alhaitham, an on-field Dendro unit that applies a lot of Dendro, it's just not really gonna happen. You're not gonna get those Ascension 4 procs. And if you're not getting those Ascension 4 procs, Fischl's damage just falls off a cliff in those teams. Like, it's still fine, it's still okay damage, Oz is still an, a fine way to do deal damage from off-field, but you're not getting the main value out of Fischl, which actually makes Yai become a much more competitive option with her. And so because Alhaitham created, I guess, more teams where you on-field the Dendro unit, then that has basically indirectly given Yai more ways in which she can be used. That being said, I still don't think that's like all that great of a use for her, because most of the time when you're playing a team with a high thumb like that, if you have Nahida, most people will opt to play him and Nahida, plus an Electro unit, plus either a Hydro unit or something else in the last slot. But I know that a lot of people end up using Kuki as their Electro unit in order to basically get that defensive utility and have more freedom on the last slot. Uh, some people use Yelan, some people use Sinto. So that's basically what's changed with her since 3.2. Her place in the meta, her pull value are still mostly where they were, which is she's a good unit, 
there's never really going to be a need to go for her because there are other units that can do what she does, albeit slightly worse, but that you are more likely to have. If you don't have those units, obviously that can potentially make her value a bit higher, but like mainly I'm talking about Kutsing in a lot of the teams where you play her, you would play Yai and either a quick swap or more on field roll. Kutsing is not far behind, and so it's hard to justify recommending going for a limited character like Yai when a standard character that you're somewhat likely to get at some point can rival her performance and do a decent job of it in, in the teams where, where Yai is, is pretty good. But she's far from a unit that's like bad and doesn't have a use. Like she, 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 she's good. She's a good unit and that's cool. But obviously, right, especially compared to the other uh, 3.75 stars, 3.7 in terms of content is a pretty shit patch, but in terms of banners is a pretty stacked patch. First phase kind of sucks or I shouldn't say kind of sucks, but the competition in first phase with Yoimiya is not too, uh, it's not too harsh. I would not rank Yoimiya as being a unit that has a generally higher pull value than Yai, but the units on the second half, right, Kazu Haina Hyphen, I would likely both rank as being generally higher pull value. Kazu is just always nice to have on an account. He, he's he's basically a, a, a an overall side grade to Sucrose, with him being an upgrade in some content and a downgrade in other, but animal units are so f right good and so versatile that it is very l possible, maybe even likely, that you're running two teams that could use either of them, so that you'll use, you will end up using both, basically. I'd say that's a gone down a little bit with Dendro's release. There is a few more teams that can get away with no animo, but it's like, they're still very good units. And then finally, against the Hytham, they actually have kind of a similar role in their better in their best teams generally, where their main role is to be a damage dealer, but like they're not doing all of your team's damage. They're like one of the good options in as like the fourth slot for a core that's already functional without them. Where usually you play a Hytham in like Quick Bloom slash uh, Hyper Bloom teams. He is also playable in uh, in Quicken teams, obviously, and he is pretty good in Quicken teams as well. But I think that the Quick Blooms and Hyper Bloom versions are a lot more popular. But both Quicken and um, and like Hyper Bloom teams are very playable without him. Just like the like Quicken on the Electro side teams where you can use Yai are also playable without her. And I would probably say that Alhaitham is just an overall slightly stronger unit. But obviously, that's not the only factor that comes into play. You might just like one more than the other. You might not really care for Alhaitham's playstyle. You might just already have what you need for the teams where you would play Alhaitham and not have what you need for the teams where you would play I. So don't let that be like the, the end all be all of everything. To finally settle a common comparison, is Yai comparable to Fischl in the role she fills in most teams? Why or perhaps why not? I would say that she is not. I'd say that she's a lot more similar to Kutsing than she is to Fischl. The main reason for that is when you look at Yai's kit, having never played her, having never put her in any teams, you'll see, okay, she, gave, she has three stacks of this, 14 second duration, deal damage over time from off field. This is a unit that will be put in a support role, right? But then you actually try her, and you play her, and you realize, oh, these animations are actually pretty long. Yeah, I can play her as a support role, but then I have a support that I have to spend like over five seconds on over my rotation, which limits my carry options. Yai lends herself a lot better to quick swamp and carry playstyles than she does to like full on support playstyles, where you kind of just get more value out of her if you have teams with flexible rotations that don't have one main carry, because it can be a bit of, of a pain to refresh the, the skill at the right moment and to use the burst at the right moment. Ideally, you don't want to use your burst right after you use your skill, because if you do like E, 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 burst, E, 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 then you're getting your triple E, then your burst, and then your triple E, and then 14 seconds later, you have no E's and you have to do them again. So in a 20 second rotation or 25 second rotation, you'd have to do your triple E three times, one before the ult, one after the ult, and then one once they expire or once they get close to expiring. Ideally, what you'd rather do is do E, 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 swap out, and then like 13 seconds later, right as your first E is about to expire, then you use your burst and you E, E, E again, and that covers your whole rotation and you only have to do it twice instead. The basic issue is that like casting her E it, like by itself, just the cast itself doesn't do anything. So there, there's nothing to gain by casting your E more often versus just having it all on the field all the time and it just being cast less often. All of this to say, especially compared to Fischl who has 
very short animations, it doesn't really play the same way. She definitely can still be used that way, but because of those like much higher field time requirements, in a lot of situations, it's actually gonna be a downgrade. Especially once you start looking into the Quicken teams with an Electro unit on field or an Animal unit on field, where you actually get props officials A4 to aggravate all the time. Generally, I'm pr I prefer comparing the eye to Kutsing because I think it's a better comparison, but they generally function the same way in their main teams. And then you can see, okay, so it's not really that she's competing with Fischl, She's more competing with Katsing. And one of the reasons why I don't like comparing her to Fischl that way is because, honestly, in a lot of her good teams, you play her with Fischl. Because Fischl is a really right good support. So, all in all, if you compare her to Fischl, she's not going to look good. If you compare her to Katsing, you're going to realize where her value actually lies. She's kind of like Katsing, with a little bit more flexibility in your rotation, and slightly less field time requirements, which lets you play some other units that you would otherwise not really want to pair with uh, with Katsing, because they're their own field time requirements are too high, and it reduces the damage that your Katsing can do. When Brudet said, and then Fischl just out DPS her anyway weird. during his review, that was a long <laughs> time ago. <laughs> to what extent is this true, especially prior to Dendro at the time? Okay, the, the tone was not all that serious. That being said, I would say that it's kind of true pre-dendro that there was just not much upside to running an electro on fielder for your teams that use electro because realistically you look at the the, the options that electro had access to before dendro came out with hydro you got access to some some taser teams which generally really like having an on-field sucrose and it's pretty hard to compete with that with pyro that's overload but overload is not really the kind of reaction that can solo carry a team you can do over vape but Yai's Electro application is very slow, so it's generally going to be lackluster. You can do Hyper Carry with an animal unit overloading, but then your numbers need to be really high by themselves, and Yai's numbers just aren't really high enough to justify it. Superconduct is not meant to be a reaction that you build around for an Electro unit, it's meant to be a reaction you build around for physical units, and uh, most of the animal synergies are, again, right, with chain reactions that I've already mentioned with Taser and... Uh, an overload. So that like you just didn't really benefit that much from using AI and there was no real need for an on-fielder Electro. That's also why Katsing was a pretty bad unit pre-Dendro. Uh, EI was better than Katsing because you could still play a double Electro Taser team. That was still fine. It, it was it was, it was was pretty good. Uh, then, But then at that point she was c competing with Beidou instead, where she had higher single target, but a lot less defensive utility. Beidou's damage reduction is pretty good by itself, but because of the way the damage reduction stacks in Genshin, it's incredible when you pair it with Sing So. So playing the team with EI instead made everything feel a lot less well it, it made it made your team feel a lot less thanky because well it was and then on top of that you had to deal with EI's pretty long animations which don't synergize all that well with units like Singto who want you to weave in normal attacks all the time. At the end of the day she just wasn't doing that much for any team but with Dendro they actually gave her something to do right she is a character that has pretty good off-field presence while also being able to proc aggravate on her normal attacks and therefore she can be a decent like driver for officials a4 she has a nice aoe nuke on her ult which is actually pretty useful in aggravate teams because you have so much consistent single target dps from officials a4 that having an option to do a short burst of aoe damage will very often help you out a lot in content where you have multiple waves or you have some small shitters with a tanky enemy stuff like that but yeah all in all i'd say it was somewhat true it wasn't to be taken too seriously she still had her upsides she was still fine and yeah better than fischl in some teams but overall would have been a downgrade yeah Okay, can you briefly address the common misconception that she's bad since a fair number of people tend to conflate your disdain for her playstyle with how you perceive her even to this day to a lesser extent? Sure, she's not bad. She's a pretty good unit. She obviously gained a lot from Dendro and she's just a good driver for Quicken teams. She's one of the many units that like, you want to carry, you already have the supports that you need, you're a pretty good unit to go for. Or you want to support for the very specific team that you already know she works well in, she can be all right there as well. Uh, I still do stand by what I've said about how she feels to play. I think she still feels terrible to play. Her feeling bad to play isn't something that's like impossible to overcome. I mean, it's the same kind of stuff as Rosaria's E, where it can be a bit frustrating 
But unless you play the game multiple hours a day, with a good portion of that being in Abyss trying a bunch of different teams, it's not necessarily gonna happen often enough to bother you. Play the test run a bunch and basically try to figure out how much you care about the vulnerability slash clunkiness that she has. If it bothers you, it's gonna keep bothering you. If it doesn't bother you, it has a lower chance to keep bothering you, obviously. How much ER does she generally need? And is it more optimal to aim for a burst every rotation or every other rotation? As usual, it depends. The main thing about Yai ER is if you're playing Fischl, your ER won't be a problem. If you're not playing Fischl, your ER is going to be so much of a problem that it's not even it's not even worth thinking about. Fischl's energy generation is really good, and then on top of that, you're getting Electro Resonance, which is also a bunch more energy. And then on top of that, when you're playing both of those together, generally you're unfielding your Yai, which also increases the amount of energy that she gets from each particle. So generally, when you're playing a Quicken team with Yai and Fischl, your ER requirements are really, really low, and they're pretty easy to meet. And you should try to aim for a burst every rotation. When you're playing her in teams that don't have Fischl, when you're playing her as a solo Electro, the ER requirements often start becoming so high that it's just not even worth going for because you lose too much damage for it, and to just go for a burst every other rotation instead. What was my stance on the change to Yai's totem targeting mechanics being rolled back? That's a good question. I don't remember what I initially thought about it. I can tell you what I think about it now, but I don't remember what I thought about it at the time. So basically what they did is they, when she came out, her totem targeting was random. Maybe not like true random, maybe there's some right here. pseudo randomness involved, but basically random. And then they changed her targeting to be the closest enemy, right? And then they decided to roll back that change. It was really fucking stupid to, to, to do the change to begin with. I'm glad they rolled it back. Well, the thing about being in AoE situations is generally, at least some of the other members of your team will have AoE. If you're in an AoE situation and you're only focusing on one enemy, they're gonna die, and once they're dead, your characters that have AoE will only be damaging two characters instead. So your effective DPS will basically go down. More importantly though, especially with Dendro, the way that uh, EI's internal cooldown works is it's standard ICD, but Internal cooldown is not shared between all the enemies, right? If I trigger aggravate on one enemy and then I attack a different enemy, I can trigger aggravate on that one as well. Which means that if my IE targets enemy one and then enemy two and then enemy three, then she can aggravate all three hits. And by the time she hits enemy one again, if she does one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, by the time she hits enemy one again, it's been over 2.5 seconds, so you can aggravate again. So effectively, instead of aggravating once every three hits, your average will be higher than that. And the more enemies you're up against, the higher the average will be up to one per hit. So all in all, rolling that back was good. Can you demonstrate the double hit of her charge attack on bosses that can, well, that would require access to an account that has Yai. I don't want to bother logging into an account, so I don't know. Speaking of the Aeon Blight Drake, what are your thoughts on her totems being able to disable it mid-air when placed properly? Uh, that's cool, I guess. That's pretty cool. EM attack or ER sends, attack sends. Her EM scaling is nice and it's cool and all, but attack sends is still just better because her scalings are pretty good and her amount of aggravates is not that high. When you look at a unit like Fischl, she gets a lot of aggravates from her A4 if you're, if you're playing her properly. So EM and attack sends are pretty interchangeable. With Yai, you're generally not getting that many. That being said, the gap can become a lot smaller when you're in AoE because like I mentioned earlier, right, that the, the ICD is enemy specific so if you're hitting a bunch of enemies you'll aggravate on average more often i'd still just say that sticking to attack is better overall uh, weapon overview how do her best four star and five star weapons stack up against each other and what are her general best free-to-play options all right the, the basic basic idea is her best in slot is her signature it's a decent amount ahead of the other options but if you don't have it it's not a huge deal like it's it's still fine in terms of four stars generally witsif will be the best one because all three of the buffs are good obviously they're not all as good as each other but they're all like buffs she can use and it's always just good to be able to front load your damage because it makes it so that first wave stuff is easier to deal with and if there's only one wave well the only wave is easier to deal with if you do end up using Witsith, i would recommend putting her on your first slot on your team that way at the very beginning of the fight when you're not actually dealing damage you're just putting down your totems you don't have the Witsith buff because you gain the Witsith buff from swapping into a character which means if you start with that character on your slot one they will not 
gain the Wits of buff. So you can place down your E's, go do your setups on your other characters, and then swap back to her for, for your burst and have all of the buffs, including the Wits of buff, to make your, your burst hit harder uh, and generally just get more value out of it. Otherwise, you have the Old Sworn Eye, which is an okay option, but in a lot of teams, you either, either don't care enough about the, the burst for this to matter that much, or you already have enough energy generation. Generally, uh, Hakushin gives you less ER, in exchange for that, it can give you an elemental damage bonus for both herself and the rest of your team, which very often will be your best free-to-play option. Obviously, it's uh, you're sacrificing a bit of personal damage for team DPS. Uh, Wandering Even Star is also a pretty solid option if you have it. I wouldn't recommend Magic Guide over that because unlike unlike Nahida, Yai's uh, attack scalings are actually pretty decent, so the much lower base attack from Magic Guide actually hurts a bit more. It's fine, I guess, but I would still generally just recommend Hakushin over it. Constellation Overview, C1, basically for every uh, balloon that you pop with your ult. I'm saying balloon that you pop because her ult sound effects sound like a deflating balloon, and it still makes me laugh today. Anyways, so it basically makes your ER requirements go from 90 to 66. It's pretty easy to see how much ER you're getting from that, right? If you were if you were needing 150 ER before that, well, now you're gonna need 110. If you were needing 130%, now, well, you're not going to need any. Generally, uh, the, the official teams hover around 130% and the non-official teams can go much higher. The thing is, very often you'll find a few ER rolls just as like, just something that happens on your artifacts, just like flat defense happens, like you're not looking for them. On average, let's say the average set has like three to four rolls of ER just existing on it. So 130% ER requirements is really not that harsh, which means that you're not gaining that much value from the C1 if you're playing her in teams that generate a lot of energy. If you are playing her in teams that don't, it can be a bit more valuable. The C2, uh, start at level two, wow. Math levels increased to four, wow. Attack range is increased by 60%. The attack range increased, like it, it, it doesn't really matter. Okay, that's not true. It will matter if the first wave of enemies spawns in a different part of, I guess, the, the, the room as the second wave of enemies, I guess. But it's just, it's just, it's not the main part of it. It's a, I guess it's an okay quality of life thing that does something, I guess. But it, it's mainly just that it increases your damage from around 160 to around 200, which is about a 25% damage increase on the skill itself. C3 is... It's a 10% damage increase on your E. Uh, C4, electro damage for your whole team, which is also nice, I guess. Um, C5 makes your nuke a little bit, a little bit, do a little bit more damage. Makes it go from 567 to 668. Somewhere between 15 and 20% uh, on the burst, well, I guess. That's nice. And then C6 ignores 60% of the opponent's defense. Now, depending on if you have other forms of defense shred, that won't always necessarily be the same amount. But the baseline amount, assuming that you're looking at a level 90 i against level 100 enemies in the last floor of Abyss, which is an increase of about 44% damage uh but yeah the, the main the main thing though is that this is only an increase on your e not on your burst which doesn't actually increase your ability to front load your damage so this 44 percent damage increase is closer in practice to somewhere between 30 and 40. all in all she's got some pretty good constellations the main issue is that they almost like, apart from the top the the column that increases burst level they, they basically all focus on her skill damage not a burst damage which is good but is the part of her kit that isn't that great in AoE. So it's a little bit more situational, but they're, 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 they're okay call. Like they're, they're, compared to the average five star constellations, they're pretty good. C1 or Kagura, C2 or Kagura. Again, I'd say it kind of depends on the team. If you're playing her with Fischl, I don't think C1 has that much value. Like, yeah, it does let you not run any ER, but very often the ER requirements aren't that huge of a deal. And on top of that, you can often just right now. slap a fab on, on someone on your team and then everything is fixed. Uh, that being said, you're going to be stuck rolling on a weapon banner, which is not ideal. Uh, versus C2, if you already have C1 and you're considering C2 or Kagura, I'd probably say go for C2. They're somewhat similar in terms of, of damage output increase, but with this, you Dodge the right here. weapon banner. And uh, yeah, that's nice. Team overview aggravate versus taser versus ride on hyper are her dendro teams truly her best ones overall and why and are Tafani's spread teams really that much worse without her. Generally aggravate is her her, her best team. It's, it just synergizes very well with her kit. In Taser, there's no real need to have an on-field driver, which means that she's basically only played for her off-field damage, which is good, but nothing crazy. In Raiden teams, her burst is a 22 second cooldown, whereas Raiden's burst is an 18 second cooldown, which means that putting her on your team instead 
instead of someone else makes your minimum rotation length go from 18 seconds to 22 seconds, which is a pretty Come on out. massive DPS loss on all of those other characters that are still getting the same amount of abilities in, but it just takes them longer to do a rotation. It is good, and it, like it is, it's it's fine. It, it does okay, but once you start actually min-maxing your teams, that longer rotation is a lot more noticeable. But for a lot of people, it won't really matter because they don't do tight rotations anyways. And if that's the case, then Riden, like playing her in Raiden Hyper is fine. It, it, she works pretty well in it. The biggest issue with that is that she doesn't snapshot attack buff, so she doesn't get to benefit from Bennett's buff for a pretty long portion of her damage. It's kind of unfortunate, but eh. Okay, are her dendro teams now truly the best ones overall? I'd say generally, yeah. And are Tafnati's spread teams really that much worse without her? I mean, not necessarily. You can play him in a double dendro team as well, but it prevents you from taking good advantage out of Fischl. Or you can play him with Beto, but then your single target damage starts becoming a little bit worse. Like, they're still playable without her, but I, I, I do think that they are better with her. Uh, also, I realize I haven't mentioned Hyperbloom at all, so I'm just gonna quickly mention that. I don't like Hyperbloom Yai. Anything that relies on Yai hitting seeds because her E doesn't target seeds and the AoE for it is incredibly small, very often just decides to not f pick, like, Hyperbloom to just leave the seeds on the ground even if it's right next to the enemy. It's very frustrating, I hate it. If everything goes right, it's actually pretty good, but everything does not go right. Everything goes wrong all the time. I hate it. It makes me angry. You can you can play it if you really want to, but it's just not something I would generally recommend. Since Vigil gets far less A4 procs when solo Electro for an Alhytham team, how well does Yai synergize with him in that regard and how would she compare to Fischl? We already mentioned that earlier. Yai actually does pretty well in those teams. It is one of those teams where Yai can be compared to Fischl and can win against Fischl, but do keep in mind that it is harder to play generally, and I would say that I generally just recommend using Kuk as your Electro option, but if you really want to make it work, yeah, it can be a pretty good team. Just make sure you learn the rotations properly. So there seems to be a, quite a bit of idle time between rotations for Yai's aggregate teams. Does this make it worthwhile to put Kazaha on Sack instead of Fav to capitalize on a bit more scroll damage? Uh, it can, but usually you're playing these teams, you've got Electro Resonance, you've got Fischl, and you've got enough downtime that you can do two, maybe even three Kazaha E's per rotation. It's pretty likely you're not gonna need that energy, and you can get away with using Iron Sting, because you're just not gonna need that much energy. Sack is still a pretty good option if you have the, the time to go for it, though. Like, if, if you have the time in your rotations to get, to get, uh, to take advantage of it. Does owning Raiden affect her pull value much, if at all? I mean, to some extent it kind of does, because Raiden can also be used, I haven't mentioned her yet, but Raiden can also be used in those aggravate teams, and she also performs pretty well, like, it's not, it's not bad. The reason why I haven't mentioned her is that generally she's better used than some of the other teams, but she is still pretty good, and if you're looking for a character to use in your Quicken team, and you're your Raiden is benched, then that could influence how much how, how much value you'd get out of Yai because you might just be missing out on playing a Raiden team instead. Does she still deal double the damage if she said her E voice lines in the right sequence? I'm not quite sure actually. I haven't played her in a while. I'm not sure if they patched that. It, it hasn't been in any patch notes that I've seen so far, so I don't think they've changed it, but Hoyo isn't known for being the most uh, open and, and and forward with their, with their changes and their ideas, so it is very possible that the interaction has been removed, but as far as I'm aware, it has not. All in all, she's a pretty good unit. She's far from a necessary one, but she definitely can perform well if you if you like her, if you want to use her. She does have her potential clunkiness issues, but if you're willing to get past them, uh, she, she will give you pretty solid performance. I hope you learned a thing or two, I hope you enjoyed your stay, and uh, I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye, you two. Right here! Right now! You made it! You made it! Here it comes the cuts! <laughs> Zajem said this, I close my eyes and I see Guapa. You don't deserve to inhale the same oxygen as me in-game. Finish hospital for you.